Welcome. Um, my name is Dr. Eleanor Reeves. I am an assistant professor of English here at Hastings College, and I'm um, introducing uh, this event and our speaker on behalf of the Department of Languages and Literatures. Um, so this is the Langbart Lecture, um, and the Langbart Lecture is held um, annually. In fact, we are extremely excited to say we have the inaugural recipient, uh, Chris O'Connor. Um, here with us today, who is the very first recipient of the Doctor Art and Eunice Langbar English <laughs> um, This is a scholarship that goes to an outstanding junior English major who has shown excellence in their English courses. It includes a financial award and the opportunity, obligation, um, <laughs> to present in a public forum on the topic of interest in that student's. Um, senior year. Um, so we were, as a department, very excited to offer this award to Selena at the end of last year. Um, she has impressed all of us um, with her brilliance as a scholar in all aspects of literary study, her knowledge of the field, her writing, and her love of literature. We know that she cares about representation and that she will be a passionate future educator. Um, Selena asked me to say a little bit about her project uh, to set up kind of what we're going to be learning about today. So, um, as you can see, Selena's presentation is entitled Reframing Monstrosity Exploring Disability Representation in Graphic Novels. Um, Selena worked with Dr. Kat Clifford in senior seminar this past fall um, on disability studies as a critical lens and was interested in continuing uh, that pursuit. Having looked at common stereotypes of disability in young adult fiction, the senior seminar project, um, she was inspired to begin looking at graphic novels um, in her current role as a student teacher at Sandy Creek High School. Um, we met in Clay Center Library a few weeks ago, and she showed me the graphic novel adaptation of Frankenstein that her students would be reading. And this has really been her inspiration for thinking about the representation of disability in such a visual medium. Um, and she's begun diving more into disability studies, especially uh, disability aesthetics. So we are very excited that Selena is here to uh, present to us her research, and then we should have time for some conversation and questions after. So without further ado, Selena Chrysler. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. So yes, as Dr. Reed said, I'm currently student teaching. Um, and the very first unit I took over in my placement was teaching this graphic novel adaptation of Frankenstein. Um, there was no particular reason for teaching the graphic novel over the original version. It's just kind of what we had in our library and what was available to us. But I was like, what a great opportunity to maybe build interest for students. Um, through the graphic format and curate lessons that teach them about the graphic novel format specifically. Um, and also, like she said, when I was doing my senior seminar project this fall, I was really focused on disability studies. And so during that same time, I was previewing this novel as well as other resources I would use this spring. Um, and it just got me viewing Frankenstein through this lens of disability studies. Um, and monstrosity as well. So I became really excited to have some of these dis discussions about graphic novels and monstrosity with my students. Um, of course, things didn't quite go the way I wanted them to at first. Um, so over the first section chunk that we read, I gave them a little quiz. And at the very end, I asked them like, what question they would bring into the discussion? What point about the book? Um, so I was expecting like really insightful, thought-provoking ideas. And instead, I got this, the part where they were naked. So not exactly what I had in mind, but that's OK. I didn't let that set us back. I just had to rethink the ways that I was asking them to engage with the text. Um, actually, I'm glad they brought this up, because it got me thinking about the strong impact that graphic novels have and the images or the messages that they can convey through images. Um, so if this image alone caught their attention that much, what other messages are graphic novels 
presenting to young minds. So I created lessons where students could explore the graphic novel format, monstrosities, and other relevant topics. So in this presentation, I'll kind of take you through some of the critical framework I used to, as a guide while teaching this novel. Um, I'll dive into disability theory and some of its applications to Frankenstein, um, as well as the how the graphic novel format and monstrosity can intersect in this novel. So first, I'll dive a little bit into disability aesthetics as a field of study. Then I'll talk about some helpful terms surrounding the graphic novel as its own format and medium. Then I'll talk about monstrosity, graphic novel as a vehicle for these stories of disability. And then finally, I'll share a little bit about my own experience teaching this novel using these frameworks. So the field of disability aesthetics basically seeks to emphasize the presence of different bodies and minds. And when I was doing my research, these were the three names that kept popping up mostly. So T Tobin Siebers wrote the book literally on disability aesthetics. Um, <clears throat> he ref in his book, he basically refuses to recognize the representation of the healthy body and the body's definition of harmony, integrity, and beauty as the, as the sole determination of aesthetic of the body. Um, and then Benjamin Fraser kind of builds on Sieber's work, um, but he focuses more on cognitive aesthetics. Um, he views, he really points out the ways that in literature oftentimes disabilities can be a foil for normative social relationships. Um, and really, they just often act as a plot device to move the story forward rather than something that's valuable in and of itself. Um, and he also discusses in his work how visual um, media can render the material experiences of individuals with people, dis people with disabilities and as people who interact with people with disabilities. And then Rosemary Garland Thompson, um, she has this book called Staring, How We Look, and she really highlights the connection between vision, what we see, and our knowledge, um, and how we live out our life and our understanding of people's experiences. So in this book, she sort of recognizes staring as this natural response to our own curiosity we have. And we have this natural impulse to seek out things that are curious to us and are different. And that's a way that we gain knowledge in the world. But that impulse is kind of contrasted with the societal expectations that staring is not an okay to do, thing to do. So even though staring is this thing that we use to collect so much information and understand the world around us, how do we balance that with what's socially acceptable? So with a little bit of that knowledge, I then want to talk about why graphic novels as a medium to present stories of disability, especially when it comes to secondary classrooms. So number one, there's a big motivation to read. I know when I presented this book, they were like, oh yes, we get to read a picture book. <laughs> so there's a plus, like reading is reading. Whatever gets them to read the book I put in front of them, I'm happy with. Um, it provides an opportunity for differentiated instruction for maybe students that are visual learners. Um, yeah, and when it comes to assessing learning, typically in education, when we think about differentiation, you can either differentiate the content, the process in which you present that content, or the product that students give you at the end of the unit. Um, so one, this is differentiating the content that you're presenting them. Um, and also, which I'll, I'll talk about this a little later, how I differentiated the product that students gave back to me at the end of this unit. Um, also, going back to Rosemary Garland Thompson's point about knowledge being connected to vision, um, graphic novels are a great avenue for representation in classrooms. Um, and then it presents a great opportunity for a study of the genre or the medium itself of the graphic novel. So just looking, going back to when they were naked, um, I've wanted them to point out to me like what elements stand out? Like what's the significance that this panel takes up a full page? Um, what are things that the in illustrator added to the body of the creature that either emphasized or de-emphasized its abnormality, I guess? So 
those were some things to keep in mind and some, as we were looking through this book. And some useful terminology when examining these type of things is signifiers. So there are three main types of signifiers. The first is icon, which we'll be diving into more. The other two aren't so relevant to our conversations today. But icon is basically a direct imitation of whatever object it's representing. Index shows a connection between the signifier and the signified. So like an image of smoke um, representing a fire. And then a symbol is basically the opposite of an icon. It has no resemblance to the signified whatsoever. And the connection is kind of something that's culturally learned through experience. Um, and like I said, icon is what we'll be focusing on mostly for today. And when it comes to icons, um, there's the scale of iconic abstraction. And so on the left, you'll see it goes from more, me more realistic on the left to more iconic or abstracted on the right. Um, so this image on the right, that can pretty much represent almost any human face. But as we move left more, um, that faces become more othered. And the representation pool kind of dwindles down. So I'll just read off this page, this comic strip. It says, when we abstract an image through cartooning, we're not so much eliminating details as we are focusing on specific details. By stripping down an image to its essential meaning, an artist can amplify that meaning in a way that realistic art can't. So with this knowledge, I began to see what details the illustrator of this graphic novel decided to focus on. And I, we kind of started to consider whether these details that are, that are highlighted amplify the monstrosity of the creature. So these are three spreads from the book, and I'll kind of open it up to the floor. What things stick out to you? What's amplified? What's maybe not amplified? Anyone can answer this. You see eyes a lot. Eyes. Right, yeah, a lot of eyes. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of men. A lot of men, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Scarring. Scarring, yes. Skin Mm-hmm, yeah. Dark, yeah, absolutely. So these are a lot of the things that my students pointed out as well. Um, so keeping these in mind, how Franken or Frankenstein was initially horrified by the creature's yellow eyes and his skin tone and all of his other unique features. So it would make sense that those are the things that are amplified in these images. So. Unfortunately, Frankenstein continues this pattern that we see a lot in literature where the villain often has a physical or cognitive disability or maybe an imperfection. Um, and oftentimes their disability is what makes them so scary and terrifying to other characters. Like Captain Hook, what made him scary was his hook. Or like the Phantom of the Opera, everyone was horrified when he took off his mask. Um, the same thing happens with Frankenstein. The original reason he's rejected by, or Frankenstein's creature. That's another thing we worked on, the <laughs> distinction between that and I still myself get confused. But that's the initial reason why Frankenstein rejected his creature. It was because of his differences, I'll say. Um, so yeah, and oftentimes the mechanism of representation um, or the mode of representation is what can render the body as a freak in these scenarios. So kind of connecting that back to the cartoon imagery and going back to this scale of abstraction, um, the more cartoony a face is, as we said, so the farther we are on the right, the more people it could be said to represent. So as we move to the left, we're othering the face more. So in a novel like Frankenstein, the more detail we add to the character, pointing out his um, unique qualities, the more we're othering that character. And the same can be said for any 
graphic novel with disability representation. So going back to these spreads, um, I thought about how realistic these illustrations are, where maybe where they land on the iconic abstraction scale, which would prob they'd probably land more to the left, more to the realistic side on that scale. Um, and in what ways is the creature othered from the rest of the characters? I mean, I think we pointed out a lot of the ways that they are with the eyes, the skin tone, like the stitches, kind of like the, just the texture in general of the face. In all of those ways, the creature is othered from all other characters in the novel. So all of these things are important to consider when looking at graphic novels with disability representation, especially if you're going to introduce material like that into your classroom. You want to be cognizant of those type of things. So the iconic abstraction scale can go even further, splitting it into images received and then words perceived. And then Scott McLeod, who I kind of used as a guide when introducing students to terms surrounding graphic novels, he argues that words are really just the most abstract icons that take more perception to decode meaning. So with this in mind, I asked myself if graphic novels can be even more effective than prose or traditional novels when it comes to represent, representation of different life experiences like disability culture and other groups. Can it be even more effective in portraying certain messages to students? So with all of that in mind, I'd like to give you a little experience of my teaching the graphic novel. So McLeod also has this quote in his novel, it's considered normal in this society for children to combine words and pictures so long as they grow out of it. So throughout the course of this unit, I kind of wanted to challenge this assumption, just as McLeod does, um, by showing the students that, like, yes, it's kind of a picture book, but there's also some value and some engagement we can do that'll be really um, beneficial for you. So the first thing we did was went over graphic novel terms and studied it as a medium. Um, I had them pick out a spread and close read it and identify like the panels, the gutters, like the words, the thought bubbles, all of that kind of stuff to just get themselves familiar with the medium of a graphic novel. We also use critical lenses. We use a variety of different ones like feminism and um, reader response, new historicists, um, and also disability studies. So it's kind of cheesy, but I had everyone cut out the little lens. And whenever we switched to a new lens, they had to take their old lens off and put the new ones on. And even though they're seniors in high school, everyone can appreciate a good craft, I think, and the kinesthetic, um, the kinesthetic aspect of this really seemed to appeal to them. Um, and it taught them a lot about viewing Frankenstein through this lens of monstrosity and disability studies. Um, and then, like I said earlier, I differentiated the product that students presented to me at the end of this unit. So they had a choice between either a traditional, like four to five paragraph explanatory essay, which I would say about half of them chose that, but they also could decide to do a one pager as well, where they represented their thinking through a graphic representation. So these are some of the results I got. I got these last week and I was just very happy with them. Like, Honestly, this one in the bottom right, I don't think he understood the book. He has the creature like throwing someone out a window. And I was like, I don't know where that happens, but I love, I love the creativity. But overall, I was just very impressed. Um, this one in the middle up there, she even remembered the lenses. So I know that that stuck with her in some aspect. And I just wanted to share those, yeah. So that's all I had. These are, I had my sources kind of spread throughout, but here's just a, another list. Does anyone have any questions, points of conversation? Can I ask how the students respond, like when you, when you have them kind of like break down the things, how they responded to the, the naked Frankenstein page, like what were some of the things that they were doing? Oh, I'll go back to that one. I mean, well, 
I don't think they really read that page, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> they thought something was happening that really wasn't. I, <laughs> they, they didn't quite see that Frankenstein has pants either. It's super It is, yeah. yeah. They mostly just noticed the scarring of the body. Like there were, I will say, there were some spreads in this book that, I don't know. I didn't love how they were represented, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was interesting, that's for sure. Yeah. Yes. So the, the product, the people who were creative and didn't just write the mm -hmm. did you start with, did they agree on that, or did you start with like panels? So I found some free, like outlines online that they could use if they wanted to. Um, I would probably, doing it again, I think I would probably put more structure around it and just have everyone do one panel and like you put this in this section and you talk about graphic novels in this section and the genre in this section. I think I would give it a little more structure this time, but they had quite a bit of freedom when doing the one pager, so. Well, I was going to suggest I recently had to create a comic um, for a grad class in Pixton, E I X T O N dot com. Okay. Can let you do it for free. And it was pretty easy, wasn't it? I mean, it clearly was better than what I could draw on my own. It was, yeah. it was pretty cool. So yeah. I just thought I would suggest that. Yes. I think they would also maybe like creating it digitally. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when you're choosing, when you're choosing the people, I mean, you can't have them semi naked in like <laughs> in like in class, kind of. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I have two questions. One is that uh, when you were talking about graphic novel terms, gutter. Gutter. Yes. Know what that is. So that's the white space that's between each panel. So in this, in this page, the panel takes up a full page, but I don't know if there's a good example of that in the other spreads I showed. Not really, like you kind of see the division between the panels, but there's not really a gutter. So the gutter would be if there was white space in between each image, if that makes sense, yeah. Yes. Um, my, my other question is, when you were putting on the computer science panels, mm -hmm. um, how, how did your students respond? Uh, you know, if you're talking to some of them, because they're just pushing the cross to you. Uh, how did you get them to keep up with you? Yeah, well, I made a big deal about it. I was like, okay, <laughs> so now we're going to take off. <laughs> the lens and put on the new one. And I made everyone do it with me. And at first they were kind of like, oh my gosh. But I think as we went along, they started to understand it more and get a better grasp of it. So yeah, does that answer your question? It's as far as the actual application. But what I'm wondering about is the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just Oh, OK. I kind of did it. I kind of did it like in a jigsaw way. So this group had a feminist lens and this group had this lens. And then we all came back together and had them share. Um, but yeah, they talked about like the depiction of women, how it seems like every woman has something dramatic and drastic happen to them in this novel because of the men. That's what they came up with the feminist lens. Um, with the reader response lens, it's kind of just based on their own experiences. They also looked at like Mary Shelley's own life um, and she had a lot of dramatic things, dramatic experiences with childbirth that might have affected this story of creation and birth. So those are a few examples of what they came up with. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm curious about the students who didn't do the graphic who wrote the extra. How did they do it? What was your so I gave them, so for if 
no matter what option they chose, I had the same rubric. So it kind of had the same requirements. But I gave them an option of four prompts. Um, and one was, like, how would you define a monster? And who in the book is a monster? And everyone that did the essay option chose that prompt. So they, I was, yeah, definitely. Yeah, they picked out things from the book that I didn't see myself reading it. So I was very impressed. Yeah. Yes. Um, right now, we're, we went back to the textbook. So we're reading like modernist British literature, but we're going to read Into the Wild at the end of the year. So, yes. Yes. When you were reading this graphic iteration in the we were not. Oh, I wasn't. No, I. That might have been helpful, but I. I wasn't. No. Yeah. Yeah, and. She, my cooperating teacher had just ordered these books in the summer and she'd never taught it before. And she said she looked for the original version on whatever platform she was ordering from, but couldn't find it. And this is just what was available. So it's kind of just a happy accident, I guess, that we read these, yeah. The original Frankenstein. Yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah. yeah. Jeff, thank you for that yes. presentation. It was fantastic, just an observation. I grew up with a library on one side of the basement and a collection of classic illustrated comics on the mm -hmm. other side. And so in representation of going from sort of the other to text, I found that fascinating because mm -hmm. I grew up reading the comics first yeah. and then trying to read the text. So like classic illustrated Moby Dick all of a sudden othered the actual words on them. It was hard to unlearn the comic to the text itself yeah, because you already had the representation in your head of what mm -hmm. characters look like or how they were acting. Right. So I, I find it fascinating in representations that take text and then illustrate how the also the reverse works where you start, right? And yeah. go from one to another. And now you've been other by this mm -hmm. text as you go back in the show. So I just think it's an interesting observation on that schema that you yeah. have where the Absolutely. words ultimately mm -hmm. yes. Yes. My, my is also sort of like more, more of a comment than a question But I think mm -hmm. uh, as somebody who's who's tried to do something very similar with different texts and literally like the overlaps between the graphic novel, the um, critical theory, and these sort of like other lenses. Like I'm really impressed with the way that you you've woven those together. And just like even in this short presentation, you've given like a really good sense of like the critical foundation and the ways that you're sort of like thinking about all of these threads kind of going between the two. So like I just want to say that like that was awesome how you're doing you. that. Thank I, you. I hope your students understand what Cool thing that is. Yeah. 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 I hope so. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Also, awesome comments. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really love the opportunity here. Um, mm -hmm. I find that students, uh, young people these days, are really good um, at visual literacy and yeah. it gives them the opportunity to like really show what they can do. So, I am so glad that Yes. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to play that role. So I'm obviously very excited that you're working on disability studies. Mm -hmm. That's one of something I've been doing a lot of research on myself, had a lot of conversations with you. Um, so what's your pitch? There's a lot of people in this room who are English professors or English teachers <laughs> or work in education in some way or form. Um, why is disability studies so important? Why should we all educate ourselves about it? And how should we be using it when we read? Yeah, so I think we already focus so much on representation in other forms, um, like when it comes to cultures um, and other identities. I think disability is something that can be overlooked, and it's just a stereotype that's so seeped in to literature, whether we recognize it or not, we're kind of just unconsciously taking in all of these stereotypes that really can be harmful and do have, can have like a material impact on the lived experiences of people with disabilities. Um, forgot where I was going with that. Forgot my next point. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you define the, the medical approach is identifying what's wrong or what's different in yeah. the person. But the social approach is identifying where are the problems in society that don't allow everyone to be as much as mm -hmm. that could. Um, and I think that shift is incredibly, incredibly important. It takes the burden away from the individual. Like, you need to figure out how to make things work to society. Society needs to figure out how mm -hmm. to do a better job. Right. I think that, that shift is incredibly Yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay. So you did the graphic novel with them and your production. Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of your observations, are you seeing more engagement with the graphic novel or more engagement now that you have? I would say absolutely the graphic novel. Just because the textbook it's the same pattern every day. You read a short story, and then they do these, they call them analyze the text questions, and it's just always the same pattern every day. Um, and half the time they don't read the story anyway. Like at least with the novel, I knew that they were taking in these images and had some understanding of what was going on. Um, but yeah, I think they just get bored by the curriculum in general, so. Yeah. I should. I'm. We've kind of just. Oh, yeah. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah. I'll, no, I'll definitely try that. We're only like two stories in to the new unit now. They just finished up these like last week. So I think I will try incorporating some of those aspects into it though. Definitely. Yeah. Um, well, it was A Cup of Tea by Catherine Mansfeld. We're gonna read Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell. So there's a lot of opportunity there. So I can't remember the other ones off the top of my head right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I'll use that. Yes. So this question has more to do with you as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, is your, and about your cooperating teacher, because I was a cooperating teacher once. Mm -hmm. And is she or he allowing you to do your own thing? You, you have this book, but you get to pick what you want. Yeah. She gives me a lot of freedom in choosing what I do. Yes. So that I yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of all of the things, both reports, slides, and the what was common to you? What was there common to you that you saw with they all of them really strongly dislike Frankenstein. That was the main common theme. But I was also surprised they didn't feel much empathy for the monster either. They they still were kind of like, I mean, he killed people, so I don't know what you want me to say. Like, so I know, yeah. So I found that interesting that they just didn't empathize with him. That much, so yeah. <sighs> Not really. No, they just didn't like anyone. <laughs> really, I think, yeah. Uh, maybe the women they empathized with because they were just like, "You had just had to discover more, didn't you?" And now I have to die because of it. So, yeah. Yes. I don't know. I'm kind of curious as I'm thinking about the graphic novel thing, and it's not directly applicable to me. The exact future mm -hmm. um, or presenting about, but there's been a lot of conversation around science fiction recently. Right. About these different approaches, curriculum in the classroom, and how our teachers use those. Do you find, have you thought at all about, or do you have about that conversation with science fiction and the graphic novel? We're all coming through, you know, with 
they would like to know. And so today, those names that are probably we're learning to read non scientific answers. Reading, did you find, like, did you think of that that maybe part of why visually we respond to images? Yeah, because I honestly don't know a whole lot about like science of reading. We'll discuss that in class yeah, coming up. Yeah, know. but yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but my cooperating teacher talks a lot about the effects she sees of kids coming with a certain curriculum, like coming through a classroom, because they just recently switched like their reading curriculum, I think two years ago. And she notices a big difference in these kids that were in elementary school with this other curriculum. I don't know the names of all of that. There's a lot of like technicalities, but I think it definitely can have an impact, at least that she's noticed in the way that they read the text. Yeah. Um, I know that some of you have probably had probably got time to hang around and have some conversations. And there are more people to hang. But can we please thank? Thank you.